Thank you, Tony. So it's really exciting to, to see many of you again. Thank you um, for coming, and uh, thank you for having me speak with you. Um, so uh, somebody told me this morning that uh, I have the bad news lecture, um, because I'm going to talk about something very hard to talk about. And that is uh, psychosis in 22Q and the development of schizophrenia. So I started off with a blank slide. This was not an accident. Um, <laughs> psychosis is really hard to define. And uh, people have thought about it now for a couple hundred years and have really a hard time figuring out what it is from not psychosis or other things that can look <laughs> like psychosis. And psychotic experiences are very common. So what we're not talking about today is really psychosis. What we're talking about is a schizophrenia phenotype, and it's really important to sort of wrap your head around that when talking about 22Q um, and psychosis, because it's really schizophrenia phenotype that people are talking about, not psychotic experiences. So um, I just, well, start off with the bad news slide. This is schizophrenia defined. So what is schizophrenia? It was recently defined, as we know uh, of it now, about like 30 or so years ago. And this is a schizophrenia, but it happens to be the kind of schizophrenia that kids with 22Q can develop. Um, it's predominantly based on this idea that uh, po the positive symptoms of psychosis or the excitability symptoms of psychosis or things like delusions and hallucinations, things that people who have psychosis haven't, were, who, compared to people without psychosis that, that don't have. Um, and you can see it's heavily loaded with those positive symptoms. And there's this little blip there at number five called negative symptoms. Um, and negative symptoms are the things like social withdrawal, um, less, less speech, or it's called uh, elogia, poverty of thought. Um, and so those are, those, are, those are very important symptoms. We're going to go over those in detail in just a second. But you can see our current diagnostic criteria really loads toward like having hallucinations and delusions and such. This kind of schizophrenia is very common in the population. It's about 1% of the population, so it's a very common disease. But it's extremely common in 22Q. About a quarter of um, people with 22Q deletion syndrome will develop this kind of schizophrenia. And it's very debilitating, so it's important to be prepared for the eventuality. 10% um, do complete suicide about 10 years, and that goes up after about 30 years after diagnosis. And about 35% are severely affected, meaning that they need to live in um, supportive environments. So. Um, so it's really important to know about the development of schizophrenia in general, especially about the development of schizophrenia in 22Q11 deletion syndrome. Um, we, you know very well uh, 22Q deletion, uh, deletion syndrome, um, and, you, and uh, Dr. Bearden introduced the, that it's very common uh, in childhood onset schizophrenia. So the red bar is 22Q um, compared to other genetic risks of schizophrenia. And you can see it's the third highest genetic risk of schizophrenia that people have identified. So it's really important to study um, schizophrenia in 22Q. And um, it's important to, to advocate for funding and such um, as, as an important group of, of people who will develop schizophrenia. So schizophrenia kind of symptoms in adolescence before schizophrenia happens, because that's really, really, really where you want to focus your attention, because you want to prevent schizophrenia. And the good news about this lecture is I think the last uh, group of people who were diagnosed with 22Q are probably the last group of people who have rates of schizophrenia about 25%. I think from now on it's going to be much lower because we can intervene early on. There's, um, and I'll talk about that uh, toward the end. So uh, Dr. Bearden mentioned the Feinstein and Banker and Skoos studies. Um, also, so also there's a, a group, uh, Devani et al. and, and Borsman. And they've found that like those psychotic experiences were sort of common. So about um, 10 to 25 percent of adolescents with 22Q will have a, a hallucination experience or believe something that's really odd that no one else believes, a delusion. Okay. So um, people have gotten more rigorous about this in the general population and have developed instruments to figure out um, these prodromes of schizophrenia. 
identify schizophrenia before it happens. And they've, been, and they've gotten really good at doing it. So uh, three programs have been identified, um, and Dr. Bearden talked about those a little bit. One is brief intermittent psychosis, um, and that's like uh, uh, hearing voices that are very distressing, but you hear them only once a week, and it just started up three months ago. So it's not, it doesn't fulfill all those A criteria, schizophrenia, that I showed you earlier, but it looks like it's ramping up, okay? The, sec the second one, and the most common one, is this sort of like low level of schizophreniform symptoms. And again, I'll go over these in detail in just a second, um, that wor have worsened in the past year. And the last one is uh, sort of just having a genetic vulnerability to schizophrenia and having your occupational and social functioning sort of drop off dramatically in the past year, okay? So when people identify these programs in the general population, they have a pretty good chance of predicting schizophrenia. And in this graph right here, you can see when they were identified at, um, at day zero. Oh, ah, thank you. And when they were identified at day zero here, so nobody has converted. This is survival. Uh, this is a survival plot. So of the control groups who don't have a prodrome identified, none of them convert to schizophrenia. So 100% of them are, are uh, stay up here. But as people convert to schizophrenia in the prodrome group, the graph drops. Um, and you can see about 30% of people were uh, who were identified with a prodrome, the, the solid line, converted to um, schizophrenia by the end of two and a half years. This is a really powerful tool, and it was sort of developed at the same time that people were recognizing that schizophrenia was common in 22Q. So it's a really um, serendipitous development in research uh, for, for, for people, for the 22Q um, uh, population. It all hinges on something, well, two instruments, but one of them um, that's commonly used in the United States is the structured interview for prodromal symptoms, okay? And it, each of the symptoms that this interview grades goes from absent, the symptoms not present at all, not even a little bit, to severe and psychotic. Um, a symptom from three to five is, it's not psychotic, but it sure is not normal. And what does that mean? Let's take the example of hallucinations, one of the most uh, uh, common uh, psychotic symptoms. So if you start hearing a whisper, and the whisper sounds like it's kind of coming from outside your head, and it seems kind of compelling to you, you don't hear it that often, and if someone said, well, that's just in your head, that's, that's about a, a three or a four, okay? That's not a real auditory hallucination that you believe in and, and have a strong conviction that there's some other voice out there, um, okay? So that's what, that's what people mean. That's not, that's not a typical occurrence. Um, and so people just started grading those kind of things on these scales. So what does it look like? Um, this, I put this slide up not only to show you what the SIPs looks like in detail, but to show you the rest of the symptoms of schizophrenia, okay? And these are other things that are just as important as the positive symptoms to look at. So the positive symptoms are delusions. Those are fixed false beliefs that no one else believes. Paranoia, those are basically like delusions of uh, persecution, essentially. Grandiosity, um, those are usually just delusions of power, so it's pretty heavily loaded on, on delusions. Hallucinations, those are perceptual disturbances, you know, hearing voices or seeing things that other people can't see. And disorganized communication. Disorganized communication is defined sort of like going off track, using the wrong words. Somebody may call that a, a formal thought disorder or a semantic pragmatic problem, so there's a lot of overlap uh, in other fields. But also, there's these three other symptom domains that are important in schizophrenia and the SIPS covers. And what the negative, of the negative system, symptoms, social anhedonia seems to be really um, important in 22Q. And so you can start seeing the overlap between um, schizophrenia and prodromal schizophrenia. Sorry? Social anhedonia. Oh, I'm sorry. Social anhedonia means that um, you don't get much pleasure out of social interaction. You're sort of withdrawn and you just don't care. Okay, 
Um, a volition or a motivation means you just don't have any motivation to do anything um, and people have to sort of prod you to get things done. Expression of emotion, um, that's your affect, uh, how, whether or not people can tell you what you're emoting. Experience of emotion is a subjective symptom and that's your ability to tell what you're feeling. And then there's ideational richness. Yeah, another thing that sort of like crosses over on autism a little bit. Ideational richness is, is um, uh, your ability to think abstractly. Okay. So one of the most uh, uh, common forms of that is something called concrete thought process. Um, somebody who's concrete, if you ask them, well, why are you here today? Uh, they would reply, my mother drove me in her car. And it's very literal. Okay. And then finally, occupational functioning. How well you're doing at whatever um, baseline job you have or schoolwork. Okay. And then there's disorganized symptoms. And this is the odd behavior, um, thinking in weird, bizarre logic, um, attentional problems, and hygiene, um, uh, not showering or caring to shower. And finally, there's these general symptoms that are associated with many forms of psychopathology that are, all, that are uh, tightly associated with schizophrenia. Uh, sleep disturbance, especially in a first episode of schizophrenia. Um, people have difficulty falling asleep and, and they feel very fatigued. Um, they have early morning wakening or intermittent insom uh, middle insomnia, uh, waking up in the middle of the night and not being able to go back to sleep. Dysphoria, which is a very unpleasant mixture of anxiety and depression. Motor disturbances. Um, these motor disturbances usually in the SIPs, uh, uh, right before schizophrenia, is, uh, is, is odd posturing. Um, but in the milder form of motor disturbances, they can be something like tics or uh, stereotypies. And then finally, stress tolerance, which is a really important one. Stress tolerance is, are you getting freaked out by your normal daily stressors? Okay, so I went into the detail, but these are the symptoms that you're really kind of looking for in clusters, not in isolation. So um, I started off with um, Tony uh, about two and a half years ago, years ago um, and you're about to see the data. Uh, many of you participated, thank you very much, um, from this study that, that looked at the SIPs and prodromal psychosis in, in adolescents with 22Q. Um, so what are the characteristics? The kids' median age was about 14.5. We had a lot of young kids because um, Tony uh, studies school-aged children. Um, uh, well, a lot more uh, uh, girls participated than boys. Um, this is a measure of socioeconomic status, which is really important in schizophrenia um, in general. And a 30 is about middle class. Um, the IQ is just as you would expect. The so social communication questionnaire is a measure of autism. It's a screener based on the ADI that Dr. Bearden talked about. Um, a score of 8.7 is well below the threshold for autism spectrum. Um, and autism spectrum uh, threshold is about 15. Um, and this is about, this is on par with kids with sub similar uh, IQs and developmental disabilities. I also had um, uh, ADHD measure. The average was 1.75. That's at the, that's at the um, 5% threshold in the general population. So most parents reported their kids were in the, the ADHD range. And it had a complementary hyperactivity scale. So the parents reported that these ki uh, their kids were more like ADHD and attentive subtype. So the, this, these characteristics of the people who participated in the study are very much like um, uh, uh, kids with 22Q have been described. Okay, so this one slide contains my entire talk from last time, um, and <laughs> I'm not going to go through it all, and that's why I masked the table like this. Um, I'll just go through it bit by bit. So this, these are all the DSM. These are all the uh, DSM mental disorders that were found in the group of kids that came to, to visit. So they're um, divided by current, if the kids when they visited had a mental disorder at the time, and ever having one. Now this is out of 20, 20 kids, so what this tells me is that um, perhaps people who came to my study were worried about something. 
because this is pretty high rate of mental disorders. It's just sort of on the edge of what most studies see. Okay. But um, the difference about, between this study and some other studies is I looked at childhood disorders too. So a lot of these kids had things like a history of wetting the bed more than you would expect. So if I accounted for really kind of uh, non-specific non or non-distressing uh, disorders, this drops down to about um, 10 people having any disorder when they visit me. That's like ADHD NOS, where you have inattentive uh, inattention that's really problematic in one uh, area of your life. Um, and these are the childhood disorders that I found. So uh, currently, uh, five out of 20 kids met criteria for PDD NOS. Um, ADHD, as you would expect, was pretty high. One kid met criteria for oppositional defiant disorder. There was more oppositional defiance, but since these kids were around adolescents, it's harder to diagnose it, okay? <laughs> um, I don't, around 14.5, it's, it's, you have to really kind of cross some thresholds to get ODD. Um, there was Tourette's disorder. I don't see that reported a lot, but there, were, there was a fair amount of tics um, in these kids. And one kid had tics so bad that it, it was diagnosable as Tourette's. And then this is like the anuresis I was talking about. That is wetting the bed. These are anxiety disorders. This is the big bugaboo in 22Q. And you see most of the kids who've ever had a disorder had an anxiety disorder. Um, the, what's interesting about uh, this is this is exactly what's reported before. So these kids look just like other studies. And Dora and Gothel, so Dr. Gothel's finding that these uh, kids with 22Q have this sort of transient school age OCD was again replicated in this study. Um, and as most of you know, specific phobia is the most common uh, kind of anxiety disorder that kids with 22Q get. And then of the mood disorders, I found mostly depressive disorders. Um, I didn't find bipolar disorder, but I was using the KSADS, and the KSADS is very rigorous about how it defines bipolar disorder. And then finally, as Dr. Bassett has found, um, substance use does start to creep up toward the tail end of adolescence, and there was one kid with uh, alcohol dependence. So what, that's what I found. What did you tell me? This is the Basque. This looks like, just like what Dr. Bearden was uh, showing you before. Um, uh, 50 is the line that's the, uh, that represents um, the normal in the general population. Each line that goes out is a standard deviation away. So by the, if you're out at, um, out at 2, you're in the 95th percentile. So what's m most um, striking is you, found, you, you reported that your kids were impulsive, and that's what this hyperactivity measurement, the BASC is kind of loaded on impulsivity. Um, that they somaticize a lot. Now, there's a problem with the BAS somatization in that it just asks if your kids got, get sick a lot. Of course, kids with 22Q get sick a lot. Um, so maybe that's why that's so high. Um, you, you reported that your kids were not very odd, but they were very withdrawn. OK, so those are the, those are the important things from what you've reported. But there's something else to think about when thinking about somatization. And this is what one parent reported to me. It maybe isn't just that the kids get sick a lot. It's maybe they have a hard time expressing their anxiety and distress. Okay, um, and you'll see this come up later in the SIPs. Uh, there's an example of this. So uh, it, it is difficult sometimes to conceptualize these abstract emotions. So now um, I'm going to show you uh, what I found in my data. So I'm going to reorient you for each of these positive symptoms. I get one score. The score goes from um, zero absent to six psychotic, OK? And um, they're in these four symptom domains. This is the P scores, creatively enough. This is the N scores, like D scores and G scores. So <laughs> um, what I found most striking, this most striking result from the study, was that very few kids had zeros all the way across for their P-scores. Now, I did interviews with typically developing kids, too, to kind of con compare. And most typically developing kids have zeros all the way across. Um, this is, remember, three, what, three to five is that threshold in the attenuated range? I found that 10 out of 20 kids had a P-score at least three or higher. Okay, in, so of those positive psychotic symptoms,
half of the kids were at least experiencing on some regular basis a attenuated psychotic symptom. Now these are kids as the median age of these kids is 14. This is way before the typical incidence of schizophrenia, especially in this population, which is around 22, 23. Okay. Um, so this is what it broke down to. This is the average P-score score for each of the domains. And you can see hallucinations had the highest average. In addition, and different from the typically developing population, disorganized communication. And this may be the overlap with that semantic pragmatic stuff or going off track or ADHD and attention. Um, the SIPS doesn't care what it's from. It just cares if it's there or not, okay? It doesn't care what it's caused by. Um, so these are the average N scores, okay? And so you'll see there's a lot of concrete thinking. That's mostly what this is here. And a lot of social anhedonia, or I just would rather be by myself, playing on my DS, um, I'll go if you make me, um, or if in a social situation, kind of like parallel playing, not really interacting, okay? Because you just don't, you just don't care to. Um, occupational functioning was, uh, was, was not the highest, um, and that's, that's probably because I think parents really support their kids. Um, th these kids are too young. Uh, for this measure, um, if left on their own, who knows what, what this would be. This is, remember, this is how well you do in school and how well you're doing at your chores. And the, so I think this represents, um, this may be confounded by parents really supporting their kids. Most kids report that they experience dy dysphoria, anxiety just fine. And so that's why this is pretty low. But they had a hard time expressing their effective expression of their emotion. Um, was, was poorer than, than, than you would expect from their report of their emotion. And so these are the, the D scores. And you can see here attention making the highest peak, as you probably expect. Um, not very oddly behaved or bizarre in their thinking. And their hygiene also was very good. But again, I think this is where parents are supporting. Because I asked a lot of kids, how would, often would you like to shower? Versus how often do you shower? Uh, and liking, you're right. Okay. And so this, this, and then this is just general symptoms, okay? So sleep disturbance, not so much, but this doesn't account for being on sleep aids like melatonin. Low stress tolerance and a lot of anxiety. So what does this mean? I'm sorry, this slide came out a little bit mangled here. These kids, remember, are very, very young, okay? And they have this sort of schizo schizophrenia phenotype in an attenuated form, okay? So what I think is happening is it's not that 30% of these kids grow up to be 22 and then magically convert somehow to schizophrenia, like it's zero or one. You don't have it or you have it. What I think is happening is most kids are hovering somewhere around the middle. They've got this stable subthreshold schizophrenia phenotype, and it can move along this continuum towards schizophrenia or not having schizophrenia or evidence of a schizophrenia phenotype. And I think there, are, there is evidence that there's things that you can do to move the kids along the spectrum. Um, now, there's this great website where a lot of researchers um, write on and update a lot. It's called schizophrenia.com, and they do uh, uh, every so often update what you can do, what's, what's coming out in the literature to, to help prevent schizophrenia. And it's very mingled up here, but social withdrawal is a big one. So social skills classes, um, even with the social anhedonia, having, having, making sure that uh, social development uh, or being forced to <laughs> be around uh, kids and developing those uh, relationships is really important. There's not much you can do about this end and interesting, this is from the schizophrenia literature. Can't do much about hypoxia. Um, now, there's no association with schizophrenia and 22Q with cardiac surgery yet, but the studies have been really tiny. So, um, and uh, there are stuff that, there are things that you can actively do as well as doing, um, getting, kids in, getting kids in the social skills and preventing drug use. One of them is treating anxiety and treating depression. I think that's a really big one. 
And I put other neuroprotective agents here because things like omega-3 fatty acids are being looked at in preventing the um, conversion or progression towards schizophrenia. Um, SSRIs can really take down the anxious tone if your kid can tolerate it. Now, I know that SSRIs have an unfortunate side effect of raising norepinephrine, too, and that's kind of a jittery activation thing. But um, if, you're, if your child has anxiety or depression, um, SSRIs are very well studied, um, and, and reducing that anxious tone can reduce the chronic distress, and chronic distress has been sort of linked to moving along this continuum. Well, not this continuum has been associated with schizophrenia in the general population. Um, there have been trials of atypical antipsychotics in the general population um, to shorten first breaks of psychosis that when schizophrenia is first recognized, as well as to try to prevent the prevent progression of schizophrenia. Um, so having access to a provider who's comfortable with prescribing uh, antipsychotic, when signs of psychosis um, that are clinically significant come up is very important. One of the most distressing things for me as a consultant to the community is getting a phone call two months after a first break has occurred and, and uh, a person doesn't have uh, knowledge of the side effects of antipsychotics, um, of providers who can provide them, or this kind of the system, what happens. So it's important to know so uh, get your ducks in a row, um, know about what these are, the side effects, and sort of make those decisions early. Strike while the iron is cold. Finally, CBT um, in England has been shown to be very effective in early schizophrenia. CBT is not just any therapy, and, and for the treatment of psychotic disorder, it's a highly specialized therapy. This may be experimental and unavailable as of yet, but there are uh, psychotherapeutic interventions on the way. And I think this is these very promising uh, innovations in the field and things that are available already um, are why I think that uh, the pre pre prevalence of schizophrenia in 22Q may go down with the next few generations. So what can you do? So first of all, you have to establish access. Uh, the prevalence of schizophrenia is very high and it, the incidence happens around times of emancipation. So having an established relationship with a provider who can connect you with somebody who can treat the symptoms of schizophrenia is really important. And that generally means having somebody uh, who can get you in to see a psychiatrist ASAP. Um, also know your system. We have a really bizarre system in the United States. It's region specific. So I can only tell you about Sacramento. But if you're in uh, Oregon, for example, you have a state system. If uh, you're in a different county in Sacramento, you have diff uh, the, in California, you have different funding and different resources available to you. So you really have to sort of know your local system. What's going to happen if somebody has a first break? And I'll be happy to talk with anybody afterwards about the kind of things you have to look for. Because remember, first break also happens after time of emancipation, so you have to know your legal limits. Unfortunately, um, after 18, people are independent. You cannot make medical decisions for somebody that you've protected and cared for all, you know, all their lives up to that point. This is probably the, the hardest thing to witness as a provider. Um, and of course, this comes from uh, with, with your own emotional limits because after several breaks, it's, it's, it's really difficult to countenance um, psychosis. And finally, I understand the treatment options way before something happens so you can make a level-headed decision when things are chaotic all, all around, if they get there. So um, with that, I'd like to thank uh, everybody who's made this study and consulted on, on the study, um, and that includes Dr. Simon in the Cable Lab, uh, the Carter Lab, who uh, has expertise in prodromal psychosis, and Dr. Robert Hendren, who advised on all the childhood diagnoses. Thank you.